Good morning, Community Action. We are watching you join the conference. This is great. Glad to see you with us. We're just gonna give folks and let the participant number ramp up here as people log on. We are glad you are with us here this morning. It is day three of the conference or day four if you include the pre-con uh, stuff. So we are, again, so glad you're with us. I'm just gonna bob and weave here a little bit while our technology catches up with people on the other side. I hope that you've had a really good week. I hope that you've gone to the platform and downloaded your swag bag. Um, if you haven't gotten your physical swag bag in the mail, um, let Jovita and Madison know, because uh, we will get those shipped out to you or let you know that yours was already shipped to you. Um, today's a bit of a community action swag kind of day. It's Friday. Um, so we are glad you are here. Good, I see people putting the good mornings Snowy Maine, we got Texas, we have Augusta, Georgia, Ooh, snowy Green Bay for a little competition with snowy Maine. Southern Maine, Arizona, so it's warm, hopefully in Arizona, though I know not all Arizona is always warm. Thank you, Lisa, for the good vibes, appreciate you. All right, Elbow Lake, Minnesota, minus two, burr, 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 so <laughs> it is cold, Kansas. Northern California, Southern Illinois, and the Sunshine State. Whew. All right. We are glad you're here. I hope that you've had a good week. I know this morning we have um, our opening plenary session, which we're really excited by. We then have a set of workshops, a range of topics. I hope that you will enjoy those workshops, and I hope you come back. For just the closing remarks, it'll be the raffle. We'll announce our winners. I know many of you have been filling up the, your bag with all the little huggy hearts in terms of the scavenger hunt. And we have some fabulous prizes to give away. So I hope that you will come back uh, for the closing session. Keep in mind, although if you don't, I just wanna put a pin in your calendar for our equity summit on April 20 and 21, that will also be virtual. And certainly our conference at the end of August, what is it, August 30 through September 3, um, we hope to be in Boston. Um, maybe we'll have a virtual slash in-person event, or maybe we'll be virtual. We will see what happens. But this morning's plenary um, with Dr. Georges Benjamin from the American Public Health Association is kind of grounded in, in, in that, right? Um, he's gonna be focusing on health equity. And as we've been talking this week around racial equity, and as we have talked in the past and in some of our workshops around the social determinants of health, uh, Dr. Benjamin's gonna ground us in this conversation on the critical nature of your work in community action and how it ties to health outcomes. And we know that in this moment where we are pivoting toward vaccination rollout, we know some CAPs are actually doing uh, vaccinations as you have public health clinics, FQHCs, family planning clinics, and other healthcare settings. Others of you are providing transportation for folks to get access to the vaccine. Some of you may be opening your sites as you did for COVID testing to allow folks to come in. There's a lot of work to be done to build trust, to build confidence, to dispel myths. And as community action agencies across this country, you are the trusted messengers. So this morning, I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Georges Benjamin, President and CEO of the American Public Health Association. When we reached out to Dr. Benjamin and said, will you join us for this conversation? He was right out of the gate. Yes, I will. We've worked with APHA, APHA excuse me, on a couple of grant applications around health equity, engaging the CBO voice in those efforts. And we look forward to some really great future uh, partnerships uh, with Dr. Benjamin and his team. So thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Benjamin. I know you've been at the association for 19, coming up on 20 years. Um, this is probably a moment in time that you have not run across. This is a new adventure in many ways, new, new, new challenges. Um, but please know that we in Community Action stand with you and we look forward to partnering with you and we look forward to your conversation with us here today. Good morning. Denise, good morning. And thank you all for allowing me to be here with me uh, today. 
<clears throat> I'm going to now share my screen and, um, and just a little talk a little bit about, it. I'm gonna talk about the social determinants, uh, then I'm gonna to pivot to racism. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how it plays out in, uh, in COVID as, as an example um, of the challenges that we have in our nation. So let's just point out the fact that I like this um, uh, definition of health. It's a holistic definition. This is the holistic definition from the World Health Organization that points out that health is um, more than just physical and mental um, health. It's also social well-being. It's also not just merely the absence of disease um, or any kind of disability. Um, it's, it's a very, very holistic approach uh, to being there. Um, you know, as a doc, I would be um, um, negligent if I just don't point out that um, health is very, very important and doctors matter. That uh, um, I'm an internist, although I practiced emergency medicine the first half of my career. And, but in our system, even though primary care is very important and healthcare is very important, um, we spend a lot of time thinking more about this healthcare system than we do about really um, the health and well being in a more holistic way, uh, as the WHO definition shows us. Um, so, with that in mind, let me just tell you, remind you that place matters. And your zip code, in many cases, is more Im important than your genetic code. Your zip code where you live um, determines access to schools and jobs and food and you know, exposure to toxins, healthcare, whether or not you can get a, a, a bus uh, close to, your, to where you live to get to where you need to go to. Um, and community is very, very important um, as we think about health in a variety of ways. That environment in which we live is very important to good health. Just to give you a sense of what I mean by that, this is West Virginia. And to give you a sense of how important place is, um, this particular um, jurisdiction is 97% white. So if you see, I'm comparing Mason County to Putnam County. Um, and these two uh, counties are, um, are both in the same state. Um, they're 97% white, but the US News and World Report does a ranking and they rank these two communities about 20 points apart in terms of health and well being. And it wasn't because, um, you know, Putnam County was more healthy than Mason County. It wasn't because um, they made more fundamentally more unhealthy choices, um, but the other county had better schools, stronger economy, and at least initially when this survey was done, spent more on public safety. And the point that even within a community of all whites, you see this kind of disparity um, that we talk about. Of course, we also have an example here. This is Delmar Boulevard in St. Louis. Um, and every community in America has a Delmar Boulevard. Um, sometimes we call it the other side of the tracks. Sometimes it's called Main Street, but it's a street where you look one side and you see affluence and you look the other way and you don't see the affluence. Quite frequently, these um, communities are segregated by race and ethnicity. Uh, and as you can see, at least in this um, community, huge, enormous differences in home value simply because they're on one side of the street or the other. Differences in the economic prosperity in terms of what these folks made, education, and as you can also see, differences in race and ethnicity. <laughs> and we have designed these communities for many reasons due to longstanding federal state and local housing policy to, um, to create these kinds of um, inequities we see in our community. And I think the more important thing is that from a health perspective, you see also huge disparities in health based on these social conditions. So I'd also point out that health is about infrastructure. So um, anybody doesn't think that this bridge collapse that we had in 2007 um, hurt people or killed people, it did. Um, and so infrastructure is a health um, thing that we need to care about. Clean water, obviously the Flint water um, challenge we had um, is a clear demonstration of 
when you don't pay attention to detail. Uh, clean air is very, very important to us. Um, where we jump our trash, you know, far too many communities um, have trash that's been put here. Look, this, this trash didn't walk up and get there. People put that trash there. I remember when I was a health officer in Washington, DC, um, we actually had trash haulers uh, who came across the bridge from Virginia into the District of Columbia, and they turned into the low-income communities at night to dump their trash. Um, and one of the public health interventions we had was putting police on the bridge at night to, to capture and stop those trash haulers, find them, turn them back, um, and even arrest them in, in some cases, I understand, um, to stop them from dumping trash in our communities on vacant properties. Interestingly enough, they did not go in the, in the prosperous part of town, the more wealthy part of town, which also had vacant lots. They didn't go over there to dump their trash in the middle of the night. We often talk about food deserts. People assume that food deserts have absolutely no place to get um, anything to eat. Of course, that's not true. They tend to look more like this, where you have places where you can buy food, but it's high fat, high salt, low nutritious foods. Um, the inability to, to get a um, fresh fruits and vegetables or a nice salad. Um, they make their margin on selling alcohol, tobacco. And they do bring business in the community, but that community, that business in many ways contributes to the unhealthiness of that community. Um, and so the goal of course is how do we um, bring full service grocery stores in those communities uh, or how we transform these, these types of stores uh, to provide more healthy foods. Far too many people in our country are hungry and we're seeing this terrible, terrible um, pandemic of hunger in our country because of the infectious pandemic that we're seeing. Um, and policy creates a big issue. So you, when well, we spend time and we um, uh, are more worried about um, drug testing people for their benefits um, that their kids need simply to survive every day. Uh, and yet we've not provided adequate drug testing programs and substance abuse programs and mental health programs to get people off of drugs. This punitive process in which we uh, treat many of our minimum our citizens of our community really needs to change. Uh, homelessness remains a big issue um, in our country. Um, and we know that homelessness is a major contributor to poor health. Uh, and the real problem we have is that people who are homeless are much more likely to die prematurely. There are a higher percentage of them don't have health insurance. And a lot of them are kids. A lot of them are kids. And people don't think about the fact that a lot of them are kids. This is the interesting chart around education. Um, and what it shows is that um, the more education a mother has, um, the more likely their child is to survive the first year of life. And interestingly enough, we have, no matter what country or what society this is looked at, the correlation between education and infant mortality is quite strong. We don't understand all the reasons for that, whether or not it's a surrogate marker for other societal issues are not real clear. Um, but it's a strong indication that if we can get um, women educated, theoretically they'll get better jobs, they'll get better health care, they'll have better outcomes with their babies. Um, that's the thinking here. Uh, and just argue how important it is for education. And overall, we know that education is extremely important um, for all genders and all races um, as part of our nation. We've got to stop this um, school to prison pipeline. Um, we have policies that um, preferentially go after young kids. And increasingly, we're putting kids in handcuffs um, for behavior that uh, when I was going to school, you get a stern um, um, lecture uh, and your mother would, would get after you when you got home. Uh, the fact that we're, um, you know, I believe in the Second Amendment, um, but far too often um, we're deciding that we want to spend dollars um, inappropriately in our schools, and yet we are not providing um, the resources that our teachers need. We need to pay our teachers more. We need to give them the supplies so they don't have to go in their own pockets 
uh, to buy school supplies for, for their students. Uh, I'm glad to see that our nation is beginning to change its policy on immigration. This is um, obviously a cartoon demonstrating the, the child separation policy, which I believe was a fundamental um, human rights violation. And I'm glad the nation is um, going away from that now. Um, and health and wealth, as I've pointed out earlier, is a big issue. Uh, it remains a big challenge in our country. Uh, clearly, um, I would love uh, to live in this house. Far too many Americans um, are living in challenging housing environments like this or like this. And so we've got to figure out what are we going to prioritize in our nation as we talk about rebuilding our communities? Because both of these situations, here and here, um, are involved with environmental exposures, injury, violence. Um, they don't have that well being that I talked about of community that's so important as our nation. I believe fundamentally healthcare is a human right, and therefore everyone ought to have um, health insurance coverage. Um, it's very important that we do that. I'm not arguing one way or another for single payer or any other type of system, but we should have a system with everyone in and nobody out. That's essential to um, trying to make sure that we uh, improve the health and well-being of our country. So let's talk about this intersection of, of, of race equity and, and, uh, uh, and the COVID outbreak, understanding the fundamentals of all of those things we talked about uh, on the social determinants. And just know that our nation um, is still dealing with an amazingly terrible outbreak. Uh, as of today, we're over over 26 million cases and growing, over 450,000 deaths, the highest in the world. We're 4% of the population and 20% of the cases. We have over 35 million uh, vaccine doses that we've delivered today, uh, which isn't very many, um, considering the fact that uh, um, we've distributed about 57,000 uh, doses delivered. If you think about that, that's only about 8% of, the, of our population with one dose of vaccine and less than 2% of our population with two doses of vaccine. Uh, I'm glad to see that the nation is speeding this up, uh, but we've got a lot of work to do if we go forward. Uh, and we also know that we've got these virus mutations we're trying to pay attention to. We now know that they're more infectious. The good news is that the uh, vaccine still works, um, although there may be some um, inability to adequately test all for all of these strains with the tests we have today. Today they work but the future we're very concerned about. And what we've already seen um, from this disease, something that we've already known, is that health inequities are amazing. They do occur. And we've seen them in COVID just as we've seen for heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, where um, Native Americans, um, Elastic Natives, um, are the highest um, population of disease prevalence uh, of COVID-19. Um, which is, by the way, a disease that is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Blacks, Latinos, even Asians in some communities are disproportionately impacted when compared to non-Hispanic whites. So this, is, this disease has caused a disparity um, both in, um, in getting the disease and in higher morbidity and mortality overall. Now, we know the reasons for that we know that there are really three big bucket reasons. Exposure, um, many people of color are disproportionately represented in public facing occupations, people working in, in, um, in, in stores, people working uh, on, on public transportation. Uh, obviously these are people who can't do work from home as I can. Um, and in many cases, they also delay shelter in place because of lots of misinformation out there. We know there's an increase in susceptibility, not because genetically there's a difference in people, because that's not true, but because there's a higher incidence of chronic diseases. And one of the things we learned very early on in the outbreak uh, when it occurred in China was that people who had chronic diseases like heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, diabetes, even obesity, were much more likely that if they got the disease, then they got sick. So if you were out working, you're much likely to more get exposed and if you have one of these chronic diseases, once you got infected, you're much more likely to get very sick from the disease. 
And then a range of those things we call the social determinants. You know, if you don't have paid sick leave and you can't take off from work to go get tested or take off from work to go get checked out if you're not feeling well, you're much more likely to go to work. If you're infected with COVID, you're much more likely to infect others. Uh, and we saw that, of course, in meatpacking plants where people would go to work, partially because they were given misinformation. I mean, partially because they, they simply didn't, um, weren't encouraged not to come to work. We know that poverty and housing situations play a big issue. Clearly, if you live in that big house that I talked about, it's easier for you to quarantine if you get sick uh, or, or if you get exposed and isolate yourself if you get sick, if you're in that big house. If you're in one of those smaller homes that I showed you, then it's much more difficult to do so um, because you may only have one bedroom, you may only have um, two bedrooms, you may only have one restroom. Your ability to, to stay separate for the 12, 14 days we keep talking about um, is highly limited. And we're seeing these kinds of exposures in families where one person gets sick uh, and then of course the whole family gets infected. And then of course racism um, and structural issues play a big role. So let's talk about how it's in many ways it has played out um, in both intentional and unintentional ways. Um, let me remind us that race is a social construct based on physical characteristics. It has no really genetic basis. That racism is a false belief in the superiority of one group of people over another based on race. That racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. It unfairly advantages other individuals and communities and it saps the strength of the whole society by wasting human resources. And I just need to publicly thank my good colleague, Kamara Jones, Dr. Kamara Jones, um, who has taught me uh, about racism uh, and the importance of me paying a lot of attention to trying to address it um, from my position. We know that there are really two, three ways to see this. Um, structural racism, which is differential access to goods, services, and opportunities by ways. Um, personally mediated racism, which is the kind we always talk about. This is prejudice and discrimination based on assumptions and capabilities about one's motives and intent. And then internalized racism. Um, and this is acceptance by any group of people of the, who've been stigmatized. They actually believe the negative messages about one's own abilities and intrinsic worth. You know, that's when you, you, you can't be a doctor. You can't be a nurse. You know, um, I know many of my colleagues were told you can never be a doctor. You should never go to medical school. And they were told to go into the trades. Now the trades are wonderful occupations, but you know, if you wanna be a doctor, um, you know, someone should track you to be a doctor and not be a plumber. There are a lot of things that you can use plumbing skills for in medicine. Um, and I, I jokingly say that because I just know so many physicians that were, where they were discouraged early on who had great grades, but because of their color and because people I've told them they couldn't um, achieve, um, they had to think about it. The good news is many of them do, but the bad news is so many people are told these messages and don't achieve their full potential because of that. So let's talk a little bit about how this may have played out a little bit um, here in, uh, in, in COVID. Uh, let's talk about literally testing. You know, one of the interesting thing was when we put the, the testing locations up, Everybody thought those drive-through testing sites were, were wonderful. I did too. Uh, but they were not usually placed in the hood. They were often placed in places for a variety of structural reasons. You gotta have a big lot. Um, but they were often were not places where people could easily get to. And uh, they were often not in minority communities. So people who were initially told, go get tested because you weren't feeling well, went to get tested and they had to take buses and trains. They had to walk to get there. Uh, and if you had a drive through and you didn't have a car, you weren't able to get tested. So there were disparities in testing simply because of the lack of attention to where we place those facilities. Uh, the fact that early messaging said, you know, go to your doctor. And if you don't have a relationship with the doctor, you don't have health insurance coverage, you don't have a primary care physician, you're less likely to be able to go to a doctor. And in many cases, um, you ended up with a running round. You, you, you called a clinic or you called the health department uh, getting the testing became a real problem for many people. The federal government paid for the tests, but far too often there's still a cost to get to the doctor's office. 
There may be, if it's just a basic physical exam, there may be a co-payment for the exam that people may not have money for. So money did play a role, uh, even though the test was, was theoretically free uh, and covered by the federal government. And if you didn't have the money, again, you were much more likely to not go get the test. Um, this is an example of how it's playing out now with vaccinations. This is an article in which I was, I was, uh, I was interviewed about vaccinations and we're beginning to see vaccination levels in disparity. We didn't learn our lesson last spring around testing, so we're repeating it around vaccinations. Uh, and here's a situation where the hospital staff uh, were notified, uh, the doctors and nurses, but the environmental services staff and janitorial staff apparently were not because they weren't linked into the hospital email system. Um, I believe understand this got fixed, but the challenge is you have to think proactively. If you wanna vaccinate everybody in your healthcare facility, you need to ask yourself, okay, who does not have access to the way I'm trying to communicate? When, when am I structuring to make sure that in my honest attempt to get everybody vaccinated, what am I missing? And I gotta tell you, if, if you had somebody from the janitorial staff on the vaccine management staff that decided on the protocol, they probably would have raised their hand and told you, you know, you need to do something a little different than just sending that email out the hospital email to, to the medical staff. Um, obviously we need to put these in the community. We're now beginning to see these vaccination sites going into the community, um, particularly for people to get transportation with 24 seven availability. Um, the federal government just announced that in Los Angeles, they're gonna put some centers in the hood and we'll see how those work out. But hopefully that will help begin trying to address some of these, these inequities that we, that we project will happen. Um, the whole issue of personally mediated racism, masking while black is a, is a you know, we, we've got driving while black and walking while black and working while black. We also have masking while black. And the challenge we have, we've seen examples where African-American men um, were felt to be threatening when they went into stores and were escorted out when they didn't do that with white patrons. Uh, these are real challenges that we have to, we have to think about um, in terms of how people are profiled and treated. Uh, and we've continued to see that um, in a variety of settings. Um, the way that plays out um, um, in, from an internalized perspective with testing uh, is the fact that if people don't know why they're being tested, you know, there's lots of rumors and stigma um, that if I got COVID, um, I'd be part of the quote unquote black disease because people are misinterpreting the higher prevalence of getting sick if you got COVID with being African-American or Hispanic. Fascinating that people made those misconnections uh, as part of their thinking. And people then said, look, I don't wanna get COVID because I don't wanna be part of that disease process. And of course, if you, if you have COVID, you can't go to work. If you know you have it, you don't go to work because we tell you, you shouldn't go to work. And of course, if you don't go to work and you work in, in, a, in an environment in which if you don't go to work, you don't get paid, you don't get paid, you don't eat. You're, you're less likely um, to be as clear uh, about your disease process. You may not even go in and get tested. But then the fundamental lack in the, in the system as we know it. Um, just the issue around the vaccine acceptance plays a big role. Um, we're now trying to address that mis misinformation. Interestingly enough, the first vac person vaccinated in our country was an African-American nurse. Um, you know, we were very, she was very proud of being the first person to get vaccinated. Uh, and we use her as an exemplar and many other leaders have stepped up to be vaccinated to try to address this issue. But we also need to have more targeted education and trusted messengers in their language and, uh, and, and doing in the people in their language, particularly for people who language is not their first language. And by the way, this is where you come in because you and the work that you do, you are absolutely trusted messengers. Um, and we need to make sure you have all the information that you need so that when your friends, colleagues, and clients ask you about vaccination and ask you about COVID, you're well-informed. And so you can help us deal with a whole range of issues around disinformation and misinformation that's going in our community. And I can tell you, there's a lot of it. You know, there are flyers flying around that says, if you get COVID, you should get on a bus, you should go in the community, right? That's just the opposite. You don't want to infect any, uh, anyone else. But there, out there, there are people that are actually telling people to do that. 
So the American Public Health Association has been doing a lot of things. Um, I had a much longer series of slides to show you all the details we're doing, but we've passed a policy on police violence. We have addressed racism as a public health problem. Um, we are capturing all of the sites around the country that um, have declared racism as a public health problem. We've published a very popular book on racism and health. Uh, and we're trying very hard as an organization to walk the talk. And we're trying to build health equity in all of our responses around COVID. Uh, and then as I close up, I just remind you of Martin Luther King's quote of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. And with that, I thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, that was a tremendous amount of information, but there's a lot of love in the chat window for you. Um, someone proposed that it should be you and Dr. Fauci working together to be the face of our nation's response to COVID. So there's a lot of love for you here. Yeah, um, Tony is one of my mentors. I first met him during the AIDS epidemic and I have learned so much around health, public health communication from Dr. Fauci. Yeah, he's a rock star and you know, uh, he got our president's award. Uh, my president, uh, Lisa Carlson, gave him our award uh, last year. We're looking forward to having many more years of Dr. Fauci. Well, and there have been several folks in the in the chat too. You, and you know the panels we've had this week, he say that have said this is the best session they've attended all week. So your information has hit home. It's resonated in a way that people can put to use. Um, people also appreciate that you showed rural and urban poverty. Just like public health, community action is in every corner of America. Um, someone did ask in the chat about, maybe you could talk a little bit about, and I think you, you, you alluded to it, it's that layering. We talk a lot about trauma-informed work on both the human services side and the health side of these equations. Could you speak a little bit to the, the concept of toxic stress and trauma-informed work um, from your perspective? Yeah, you know, children are, children are resilient. But the challenge you have is if, if, you, if, you're, if you're in an environment, first of all, the brain is a phenomenal tool. And we've learned, an organ is probably the better way to put it. We've learned that it, it imprints experiences, um, in a variety of ways. We don't, we're not smart enough. We haven't figured it all out yet. But being felt wanted, being not being hungry, so being well fed, living in a, an environment that is where you have limited stress, noise, infighting, you know, where you're afraid to go outside for violence. Um, where people are exposed to drugs, either directly, even secondhand smoke. All of those things imprint on your brain. And so children who go in these environments develop what we call toxic stress. And we were able to now demonstrate that it has enormous impact on their health, well-being, and capacity um, to, um, to achieve. One of the more fascinating things is that, and I learned this, um, so I'll tell you one of my, my, my quick stories. So I was, uh, I was a health commissioner in Washington, D.C., and um, I was, um, the Queen of England had come to D.C. to uh, visit. And now they were going to have the reciprocal visit for some of the lower income kids to go to, to Britain. And I was in the office of the, of the Human Services Committee director, um, chair of the committee, um, H.R. Crawford. H.R. used to bring me in at least monthly to, to, to yell at me, to remind me who was really in charge of health in the city. And so I was there getting my, my monthly whipping. And these kids had come in uh, who were going to go on the trip. And he sent them off to have lunch. And then he and I were talking about the trip. And I was pointing out the fact that these kids were going to have a wonderful time in Britain. And I was talking about all the things I wanted to see. Now, I wasn't going on the trip, but all the things I would have wanted to see. The Queen, Buckingham Palace, the Double Dipper buses, all those wonderful things. And you know how it is when someone's, you're looking at someone and having a conversation and realizing that you don't have a clue? So I stopped and said, okay, what am I missing? 
He said, what you're missing is, now this is Washington, DC. These are kids, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, et cetera. They happen to be downtown in the district building, which was at that time, downtown DC. Um, he said, these kids were not excited about going to London they were excited about going to the airport because these kids in Ward 7 and 8 in DC, the poorest wards in town, had never been to a national airport in a city 10 square miles. So their life experiences was limited to seeing these planes coming over the horizon. If you've ever been over that side of town, the planes come over the horizon and they've never seen where those planes are coming from. You know, you can get to National Airport if you go on the Metro, but the Metro doesn't go to their ward. So my life experience was thinking about how limited these kids' life experiences. Now, once they got to London, I know they had a wonderful time because I talked to when they got back. But they, and it wasn't just, they didn't know, they didn't want to get on the airplane. They wanted to get to the airport. That was the limit of their thinking and the limit of their world. So I know one of the things we have to do is we have to expand these kids' understanding of their world. And then, then they'll soar. Great. Thank you. For, for that um, and folks are echoing that in the chat as well, saying that that, that is something that they have seen as well um, with I'm families bad. that they certainly work with. Some co comments in the chat also about vaccination information <laughs> and community action, just like public health, right? We're everywhere. And both our employees are representative of America, bringing along oftentimes the same sort of um, understanding or misunderstanding of, of maybe some of the facts around vaccinations. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, maybe it's two-pronged, A, how can community action agencies work closely with public health in their local communities to, to expand their role of trust and messenger and be engaged? But also, how do we work with um, both employees as well as folks that we're serving who, for justifiable reasons, have some very significant doubt about the vaccination process? Well, obviously you have to do this in the context of your job, and, but let, let, let's, let's start with the science, what we know about the vaccine. Um, the development of the vaccine has been a, a scientific marvel. But even though we talk about the fact that we have um, done these vaccines in record time, not a single step was cut in the science or the research of these vaccines. That's the important thing, first thing. Secondly, to know that even if we talk about, yeah, yeah, we did this in a year, and yes, it is true that the fastest vaccine we've ever bought from conception to reality is four years. The truth is, we've been working on a vaccine like this since 2009, since the first SARS outbreak. And we knew a lot of things. We learned a lot of things about vaccinations for SARS-CoV-2 um, from what we learned from SARS-CoV-1. First of all, the spike protein, I call it the spiky thing on the crown of the virus. All, everyone's seen the picture of the virus, the spike. We learned that that piece of the virus structure is what made your body react. That's often the piece of research that takes years to figure out. And it did take years to figure out. But we did that years ago, and then we've had a, we've had um, MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is another COVID um, a SARS virus. And by the way, the SARS virus in that family of viruses is the family of viruses that caused the common cold, or at least one of the cold viruses. So we've been trying to make a cold virus um, vaccine for as long as I've you know, pretty much almost as long as I've been around in medicine. So it's not like we, you know, this was conceived a year ago. It was conceived many, many, many years ago. In fact, we actually had several functional prototypes. So we were able to just simply go based on everything we'd learned. And the use of the mRNA, they've been experimenting with mRNA vaccines 
um, and, and ideas for 20 years because we want to use them for cancer as anti-cancer tools. So the point is, this is your tax dollars that work through the National Institute of Health, an amazing amount of science all coming together and the whole world focusing on a single problem. That's why we were able to do it so fast. Now, it's also important to know that this um, vaccine is infected, is effective to reduce the disease, but less effective in reducing infectivity. At least we don't know yet because we haven't done the studies. So we've done the studies to show that it, it can, um, it's effective in reducing people from getting sick and dying. But they're just now doing the studies to prove that it also reduces transmission of the, of the disease, okay? And we will focus like a laser on sick and dying because sick and dying gets you back to work. Getting the sniffles or no symptoms at all tells you you just stay home for a few days, okay? So the vaccine is safe and effective um, in, the, in that context. And we, um, um, I encourage everyone to get the vaccine. Um, and as soon as I'm in line and I have the ability to get it, I'm going to do that. I, I'm, I'm absolutely essential. Um, I, I'm not an essential worker. Um, I'm a worker who can work from home. But there are people that are you know, teachers and the people driving our buses. I absolutely want them to get their vaccination. Uh, and if you have chronic diseases, I absolutely want you to get your vaccination. So I, I encourage everyone to do it. Well, someone just wrote in the chat that in your comments today have had at least one outcome. Thank you for the explanation. You have relieved my anxiety about the vaccine. That makes sense to me. This is very much appreciated. Good. I'm with you. As soon as I can get, I'm able to work from home. As soon as I can get the vaccine, that is something that I'm going to be anxious to get. I, and I too agree with you. I hope everyone in this network gets to a level of comfort and willingness to take the vaccine. I think that is where and how our country moves forward and whatever we can do to encourage our customers and clients as well, I think is gonna be critical. Let, let, me, let me add one more thing to that, Denise, if mm -hmm. I could. Yeah. The risk of the disease is higher than the risk, any risk of the vaccination. I think that's the way to, to think about this. This is a sick. bad disease. Yeah. And it has, if you get sick, even if you don't have a lot of symptoms, there's a population of people that get a chronic syndrome that goes on for months. You don't wanna get this, one, okay? And what we do know is that when you get the shot, granted, very small number of people can get allergic reactions, but most of those people know they have allergic, allergic problems. We have to deal with them separately, but it's a very small number, no different than any other vaccine. But the worst thing that most people get that aside, sore shoulder, fever, headache, feeling really like crap for a couple of days. It, it, people are just so appreciative of you putting this into plain English. And um, I'm glad we've have it recorded so folks can go back and listen to it as well and capture some of the key themes and key talking points to work with the families. Uh, and this is something that we've seen in terms of, you know, people are trying to, you know, we've seen toolkits, we've seen webinars and real folks, right? That's not, attending a webinar is not gonna be the way that most folks gain a level of comfort. You have recommendations for our, because we have, we have teams, you know, who are the ones putting, who are working directly with families. They're in the Head Start classrooms that are open directly with, with, with little ones and working directly with their parents. We're the ones putting the food boxes in the trunk of the car mm -hmm. and, and interacting with families. You know, there are places you can put in pieces of paper and cards and information. How can, how can community action work closely with public health to convey this information out? Um, in ways that you have found historically through research to be effective as trusted messengers? Yeah, yeah. well, I think the first thing is that all of us need to be armed with the same information mm -hmm. so that we're giving, we're giving accurate information. That's the first thing. Yep. Second thing I think is um, in the context of your organizations, uh, reaching out to the state and local health departments and offering to partner with them. Um, you know, the, um, I was on a phone call with Cure Violence the other day. Some of you may know Cure Violence. They, they do a lot of violence 
prevention in communities. And because they're in the hood and they know the people in the community and they're still out working and about, they've pivoted to COVID-19 and they're doing exactly what you're talking about. They're educating communities. They're, you know, um, they're sharing inf the right information because you know how you know how it works. You're providing someone a service. You're in their home. You're they're coming to you for to, to get some food, and because you you're trusted by them, they will ask you that that question that they may not ask anybody else. What do you think of the vaccine? You don't need to give them a long scientific explanation, but you do need to be able to to uh, be comfortable giving them the right answer, so that you at least. And if you don't feel comfortable giving them the answer, that's okay. But figuring out where you can send them. Um, so for example, a couple quick things. Number one, they may ask you if masks work. The most effective thing we have right now, short of vaccinations, wearing a mask, washing your hands, keeping your distance. That trio of public health interventions is extremely important because it's a layered series of protections that reduce your risk. Nothing gives you 100%. The only thing that gives you 100% is going into one of those bubble suits, staying in your own room, and not eating for you know a year <laughs> until, we, until we solve this problem, right? None of us are going to do that. So what the goal is to reduce our risk. You want to reduce your risk? Wear, wear an appropriate mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, become informed, and when you're eligible, get vaccinated. Um, that, was, that will get us back to, quicker. But in terms of the partnership, you know, having your agencies reach directly to your state and local health department and say, hey, we're here. We're here to help. Here's the value we bring to the table. Uh, and you bring an enormous value. And there'll be more people reaching out to you because we know we need to have people to go into the hood that can do this. Um, when I was a health officer in DC, we actually hired, we worked with community action partners um, we worked with um, community health workers. I had some that worked for me for maternal child health, HIV AIDS, our nutrition programs, and they could find Johnny when nobody else could. They could go into communities at, you know, nine o'clock in the afternoon that I could not go into, okay? Because they were trusted in those communities. People didn't lock their doors when they saw them coming. You know, they would answer the door if people went and banged on the door and said, hey, I got some information. If they handed them a flyer, they would read it. So that's the value, you, the enormous value you bring to this enterprise. You have given us our marching orders. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, people have really been active in the chat and in the Q&A. So thank you to everyone for doing that. We'll capture that information as well and see where we need to follow up. Before we sign off and send people off to their workshops, any last comments, Dr. Benjamin, for, for the army of uh, in the front line of working with families that you'd like to share? I don't have a message other than to say, look, I want to thank you for what you do. Um, the American Public Health Association's quest is to make America the healthiest nation, because we're not, compared to other industrialized nations. We will not get there without you. And so thank you for everything you do. And I look forward to our strong relationship in the future. Sounds good. Well, you've made a difference today. This will ripple out across the country into communities that we'll never know because the team here, they touch the lives of so many people every day. So thank you for your work, your dedication. And if we can get you and Fauci together, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. So thank you so much for being with us and seeing the value and, and depth of community action. We appreciate you and your whole team. So thank you for being with us. And thank you, everyone. Enjoy your workshops uh, here today. And we hope to see you at the closing session. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.